People have not ever totally neglected Wildland Park. One of the things that happened when, when uh, the collaborators started to put together their programs is that they, they looked at the history of, of, of the area. And what they found was that there were several attempts in the past, many attempts in the past, to ameliorate poverty, to get rid of uh, the causes of poverty. Because one of the things that happens is they were, there were two large factories here, for example. Once those factories closed, people lost the opportunity uh, for employment, and when you lose employment, then you lose the opportunity to maintain your housing, to maintain your families, you know, and, uh, and a lot, you, it, it begins a downslide. This happened in many uh, communities all over the, the nation, so it's not a new story. But what happens to the community is there becomes a, a sense of defeatism. You know, they don't, they, people come and they say, we're going to do this and we're going to improve things. And uh, they, they kind of throw money at it and they, they put somebody in an office and nothing really happens. It's just, uh, they, they don't really engage the community. Uh, they were actually in the early part of this these programs, they, they actually got a knock on my door and somebody wanted to interview me about uh, environmental impacts. You know, it, it just was simply, you know, how dirty is the alley? Well, in fact, it's very dirty, you know, and what could be done to improve that alley? Well, you could have more pickups or you could put out, you know, more trash bins. Simple solutions, but nobody ever asked before. And Middle class systems will create programs create policy, uh, make all kinds of decisions, and never ask a poor person if it's the right thing, if it's going to work or be helpful or any of those issues. So it was in that process that we began to share with the wider community the gift of having low income persons at the table. Um, okay, we know that's the reality, so now what can we do in very incremental ways to have an impact on that um, experience for somebody? So definitely more an applied focus than a policy focus. I realized that we knew a lot, but that we really weren't applying our knowledge in, in the kind of fashion that would put together these solutions that will really make a difference. Whatever the problem is, if you want to solve a problem, you really need to understand the causes of the problem and what the people who are impacted by the problem, how do they feel? We're getting what I think is a personal snapshot of what they're experiencing, whether it be health, safety, uh, issues surrounding neighborhood interaction, neighborhood involvement. It gets a very personal response when you're asking people particular questions that are on the interviews. My mom did it all by herself and she had no help. It's just kind of hard. It's And I think that's really the difference here with the collaborative is the, the outreach effort, the, the genuine effort to reach and invite people to come here. The getting ahead classes are some of the most important work that we've done because it allows persons in poverty to begin to do their, their own self-exploration. And it's not us teaching them it's their own exploration of their own choices uh, and issues. And so it's a self-discovery. And one thing that getting ahead does is it, it, show, it shows the people that they deal with that you know you have power and it helps them empower themselves. With those programs, they're boot laces that you can grab a hold of and pull yourself up. 
I've listened to the testimonies of some of the young people who are involved in these programs, the moms to be the getting ahead program, and talk. You know, it'll bring you to tears to hear them talk about how these programs have literally changed their lives, primarily by changing their perspective about who they are, one, and secondly, about who they can become, because it's a world very different than the world that they have experienced their entire life. The Getting Ahead program helped me because I guess I didn't know I was in poverty. <laughs> I just didn't. Um, I know I was poor, but I didn't look at it as all poverty. I looked at poverty as like uh, third world countries, you know what I mean? So I was just like, no, I'm good. I went to seminars, I joined breastfeeding network clubs. It was just amazing. Um, to this day, I still um, run a breastfeeding network program with my lactation consultant. Um, we had a time where we had getting ahead graduates and then folks throughout the community who had been trained in bridges and there was a desire to match folks up. So the volunteers from the community were called allies and the getting ahead graduates were called circle leaders. Michael and Jane went actually to the dealership with me on a Saturday. Um, and they helped me weigh all my options. They didn't give me um, like ultimatums or they didn't judge me. They exactly broke down in layman's terms what the dealer was trying to say to me and told me, well, here are your options and this is what you need to choose from. I think one of the things that's been most important to it is that they, you're both open people and you had your initial ideas of this is how this might work, but you were always open to the idea that there was something else and that there was something different and that that might be okay. That helped us explain some of the work-life balance issues that were being brought into the into to work. Uh, why people were showing up late because they had transportation issues. Uh, why people were at work but not really productive because they were worried about their teenage daughter at home or some of the other issues. Um, and also looking at you know missing training opportunities and advancement opportunities because we didn't really understand the demographics of our workforce. Been real quiet, darling. Anything in your heart you need to put out there? No, I really enjoy this. We need to do this more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at least we'll get into know what is needed and what we all can do to help. What they do is after we evaluate everything and think we've got it better, mm -hmm. we may come back and say, okay, mm -hmm. starting October 1, here's mm -hmm. what we're going to do for the next two months and to see if it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We may not be spot on on everything, right. but we may do it for two months and then say, okay, we're going to sit back and evaluate. Because sometimes these long-standing policies right. is what gets us right. in trouble. Yeah. Not always in trouble, but in the gray area. Right. Yeah. We've been interviewing young black men in the neighborhood and figuring out, talking to them about their interests, their um, experience in the neighborhood and what they would like to see um, as far as like programming and events. Young people are going to inherit their communities. 
and it's important that they're very invested in the development of, of their neighborhood and the development of initiatives or policies or programs, that we really truly listen to them and take what they have to say to heart. The ones who are going to be most impacted and affected are the youth. Okay. Because y'all, you guys are the future. I think about the kids only though, you know what I'm saying, because eventually they going to grow up and looking at our decisions, you know what I'm saying. We're, you know, United Way has made a choice to head up the Youth Development Task Force. We were asked, you know, by the collaborative members and we, you know, it, you know, definitely wanted to, you know, take on that opportunity. Um, you know, part of the issue is that we just didn't have a lot of information about what young people are thinking about, and particularly African American males. We have had several community conversations with adults who are concerned about what's happening in, for young people in the neighborhood. We've had a, several conversations with some groups of young people, but really um, young African American males, it, it, it was that, that perspective was absent. So when you talk about accessibility, you know, there's a lot of different thinkers around the table, the decision in the decision making table, funders, um, community residents, but these were issues that they just, you know, may they may know about but don't really have the first hand knowledge about. And so this was an opportunity to build that body of knowledge and that's gonna feed into our development of, of kind of transformative initiatives or recommendations to support improve youth outcomes in it. A new hope, new aspirations that they achieve simply by participating in programs where they are not judged, where people do not look down on them, where people tell, give them the idea that yes, they can achieve a middle class lifestyle, which is very different than a poverty lifestyle. It's very different than a poverty mentality, which is a mentality of failure, it's a, uh, a mentality of defeat. If we can track that, we can bring these smart researchers who ask good questions to pay attention to how we do it and if it works, then you have a scalable model. Then you can do something in another neighborhood and you can do it in another state or maybe another country. So I believe that that's the objective, to have an impact, be able to track what works and then do it again. Hey.